Okay, so the last of the Warner Mamless uh, last group uh, is Dr. Nick Ryder. He comes from us by way of Pennsylvania um, and the Rochester School of Medicine. And we'll be presenting on a sulcus fix lens um, that they've been uh, testing with cadaver eyes. Thanks, so, Nick. Thanks. All right, can you hear me? All right, uh, today we're gonna be talking about a new uh, piggyback IOL uh, that we did a study on in pseudophagic uh, cadaver eyes. And um, again, we have a research grant from Metacontour, the uh, maker of this IOL that was using this study lens. And so um, we're just gonna talk about why uh, we use piggyback, um, otherwise known as uh, supplementary IOLs. Uh, go into the history of piggyback lenses and then talk about the study that we did with the uh, new Metacontour lens. Um, so a patient that already has a primary IOL, um, you can add a piggyback lens in to add multifocal or toric function to that primary IOL. Um, a more common indication is to deal with post-cataract uh, surprises. As my fellow fellow John touched on, uh, you can have some options um, for post-cataract um, surgery refractive surprise. Uh, the easiest is glasses or contacts, but most patients want to be spectacle free. Um, you can do PRK or LASIK, um, and that, that is more refractive fine tuning. You can use like 0.1, to, you can get within 0.1 or 0.2 diopters uh, of your goal refraction. Uh, it's usually more expensive and out of pocket. Um, your other options are lens exchange or piggyback, which are usually uh, covered under insurance. Um, and you can get within about half a diopter of your uh, goal refraction with that. Um, as far as lens exchange uh, versus piggyback, lens exchange is a more technical surgery. Uh, depending on the study that you look at, um, you can have up to 50% uh, zonular dehiscence, uh, about 8% chance of capsular uh, rupture back into the vitreous. Um, whereas with piggyback, <coughs> it's a lot simpler of uh, surgery. And um, the one study I could find that was head to head uh, with piggyback versus lens exchange, uh, better outcomes are reported in uh, piggyback implantation uh, with 92% of eyes getting within that goal uh, refraction versus just 82% with uh, uh, lens exchange. Um, so the first time uh, piggyback was uh, placed was in 1993 with a patient that needed a, a 46 diopter lens, uh, which isn't available. Um, so um, uh, Dr. Gayton uh, chose to put two lenses into the bag to achieve the 46 diopters. Uh, in that case, a microphthalmos. Um, the patient actually had good vision like a year, year and a half out. Um, and this was done, uh, two lenses in the bag uh, throughout the 90s. But um, a complication of having two IOLs in the bag is uh, interlenticular opacification. So it's pretty much the same phenomenon <coughs> as PCO. You have um, the lens um, on the picture on the right, the equatorial um, capsule uh, cells can grow posterior to the primary IOL to cause PCO. Um, or if you have two IOLs in the bag, they can be funneled between the two IOLs um, and hyperpla cause hyperplasia between that uh, and cause opacification. Um, in addition, the, the piggyback lens in the bag can push the primary IOL posterior and cause a hyperopic shift uh, with that. And so uh, in the early 2000s, instead of putting two IOLs in a bag, they started placing the piggyback into the sulcus. Um, but the lenses they were putting into the sulcus were originally engineered to be in the bag, um, and that caused the complication. Um, so on the left, you can see this is an Acrosoft. So this was designed to be in the bag. So it has very sharp optic edges uh, to prevent PCO. It has a very textured sidewall, and that's to prevent um, the positive dysphotopsias you can get at night when you have oblique light coming in and reflecting off of the optic uh, sidewall uh, coming back onto your retina. But what happens when you put um, a textured sidewall and a sharp optic edge into the sulcus? It can chafe up against um, the iris and cause deposition of um, IPE cells, as you can see on the picture um, on your right, um, causing pigment dispersion syndrome. Um, and even worse, that can lead to pigmentary dispersion glaucoma if that ends up in your canal schlem. So how do we avoid um, the ILO, ILO, which was when we had two lenses in the bag, uh, and how do we avert, avoid pigmentary dispersion, dispersion syndrome, um, which is caused by the optic rubbing up against the iris? 
Um, so between 2007 up to the present, uh, a couple of uh, lenses have been put on the market, specifically engineered uh, for uh, piggyback implantation into the sulcus. Um, and they're designed with uh, round optic edges and thin haptics to avoid that chafing um, that something like an Acrosoft lens would cause. So on the left, you can see uh, it's very sharp IOL optic edges. And on the right, that's a sulcaflex lens, uh, very soft and undulating um, edge. So if you had to choose one of those to rub up against your iris, you'd want the, the rounder one, obviously. Um, and these piggyback uh, sulcus IOLs also have posterior haptic angulation. Um, so as you can see in the picture on the right, um, it kind of vaults the optic posterior, and that's again just to avoid any possible rubbing up against the iris. And um, they also have a, the piggyback lenses have a concave posterior surface, as opposed to a convex convex configuration, which um, IOLs usually have. Um, so you can see on the right, the, the red is outlining a piggyback lens, um, which has that concave surface, and that's just to increase the interlenticular uh, lens distance to avoid uh, the optic optic rubbing. Um, and in general, piggyback lenses are larger than normal IOLs, uh, around 14 millimeters in diameter. Uh, overall diameter with the haptics, um, your sulcus is like 11 millimeters, um, and the optic is six and a half to seven millimeters. Just to compare, the sulcaflex is 13, which is on the bigger end of ILLs, and about six millimeter optic. So none of these are FDA approved, but at least on the European and worldwide market, there are three uh, piggyback lenses currently used, uh, the Rainer sulcaflex, um, the Aspira, and the first Q uh, first add-on. Um, so if you notice, the, the first Q has this kind of square uh, optic design, um, which is theorized to prevent uh, pupillary capture. And um, that's our, our current study lens also has that design. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about the study that we did on um, 12 uh, cadaver eyes, which had primary IOLs already in place pre-mortem. Um, so this is our study lens. Again, it has that same kind of square uh, design as the first Q, first add-on. Um, it's a one-piece hydrophilic acrylic. Uh, it has the same uh, large dimensions as the other three IOLs in the market. And it has these four flexible loop haptics that uh, configure into different sizes of, uh, of sulci. Um, so we did a Miyake apple technique, which is cutting coronally the eye, placing some glass and gluing the eye to it. It just allows for easy uh, video photography from the posterior view, which we don't usually get to see in eyes. Uh, we did a pre-op OCT. Then we removed uh, the cornea and the inner iris, leaving the peripheral iris to simulate uh, pupillary dilation. Um, we then inserted the add-on lens and uh, did post-op OCT and anterior and posterior photographs. And we were looking for um, to see if the IOL was centered, if there's any tilt in the IOL, um, as well as assess the interlenticular space between the primary and piggyback IOL. And so don't get lost in this table, but this is just um, to show that we specifically chose eyes from our library of eyes that we have in our lab uh, of different uh, axial lengths um, with different primary IOL materials representing acrylic, uh, PMMA, silicone, et cetera, and uh, different amounts of sun rings ring just to kind of uh, replicate any possible clinical scenario that our study lens could find. So as you can see, uh, different amounts of sun rings ring and primary IOLs, and these are the actual eyes we used. And so what did we find? So I'm comparing um, what we found in this study uh, to what we did in a previous study three years ago uh, with the sulcoflex in an analogous um, study. So um, in all 12 eyes, um, the lenses never touch. There's always a positive interlenticular uh, distance between point, uh, 0.3 and point, uh, 1.2 with the metacontour compared with the sulcaflex, which also always had some kind of uh, interlenticular distance, but was a little closer. Um, three years ago with the study with the sulcaflex, we found <clears throat> a correlation between the amount of sum rings ring and the amount of inter interlenticular distance. So the more sum rings ring was present, the more it kind of vaulted that piggyback uh, more anterior. Um, we, we found a weak association up to moderate, but that trend didn't continue um, this year with the metacontour with severe sun rings ring. So we didn't find that same association. Also with the sulcoflex study, um, we found that with thicker primary IOLs, like silicone, there was a smaller interlenticular distance just because it occupied more of that space. 
Um, we did not find such an association um, this year with the metacontour. Um, as far as tilt, uh, we found four cases of tilt. One was due to an area of localized Summerings ring, which I'll talk about, and three cases due to uh, zonular dehiscence. And um, subjectively, um, all 12 eyes uh, had the piggyback lens well-centered um, as per Miat view and OCT. So I'm gonna talk about uh, the two cases of tilt uh, that we found. Um, so this is um, eye number three had a localized couple clock hours of inferior Summerings ring, as you can see. And um, I kind of overlaid a ghost image of the, uh, of the study eye well, which in reality is anterior to all these structures. is a posterior view of the eye. Um, so those loop haptics would actually be anterior to the ciliary processes and the Summerings ring. So when Dr. Mamlis um, put this uh, IOL in, that inferior haptic was overlying the Summerings ring. And with my animation here, it kind of vaulted the inferior haptic anteriorly, um, causing some tilt on OCT. As you can see on the left, there's just less distance on the left between the two IOLs than on the right. Um, so doc, we, Dr. Melmus then rotated 90 degrees so that each of the loop haptics were kind of straddling that localized Summerings ring. And as you can see on the left, that resolved the, uh, the tilt. This is a before and after on the left and right of the tilt, before and after that rotation to straddle the Summerings ring. Uh, we also had some cases of zonular dehiscence, causing cases of tilt, as you can see here on OCT, uh, the piggyback relative to the primary. Again, the piggyback is on the top and primary below that. So this is an anterior view now uh, of the eye. And as you can see, these, these loop haptics should be anterior to, in other words, closer to the camera than the ciliary processes, but they slipped posterior to the ciliary process due to um, compromised zonular, zonules there. Um, and in eye number eight, you can see on an anterior view, uh, that gap between the bag, which is uh, visualized with the Summerings ring, and the ciliary processes, there's about four clock hours, three clock hours of uh, zonular dehiscence. And indeed in that eye, we did find a tilt when we, in place, when we implanted the study IOL. Uh, and on anterior view, again, we found one of the haptics slipping posterior to uh, the ciliary uh, processes due to weak zonules. It's kind of hard to see, but this is an um, posterior view, and you can see the outline of a loop haptic there. So some of the take-home points um, from the study um, just outlines the importance for the preoperative exam when you have a patient that you're gonna implant a piggyback lens into. Uh, if you can identify any isolated areas of some rings ring, uh, then intraoperatively uh, you can plan to straddle the tabs if your um, lens has four tabs to straddle or if it has two. Again, just to rotate 90 degrees to avoid uh, any possible tilt. Um, and although very difficult, attempt to identify any zonular dehiscence preoperatively um, so you uh, don't misplace a tab uh, posterior to the uh, ciliary processes. Um, but in general, uh, this metacontour uh, study lens centers well. It fits into a variety of different sizes of eyes with different amounts of some rings ring uh, with different uh, primary IOL types. Um, it always has a positive inter interlenticular distance um, and has minimal tilt um, in the absence of um, zonular dehiscence and isolated Summerings ring, at least. And with that, uh, thank you, and I'll take any questions.
States made a conscious decision that it wasn't worth going to a city that was a piggyback bank region. So you don't have, the only piggyback banks that really got available now in the U.S. I mean, looking at the tax receipts last year, the CP Silicon 